Thank you. Thank you. I'm going to stand out here because I'm more comfortable out here than behind a wooden box. Um, my name's Phil, and I'm glad to meet you all, and I'm, and I'm so happy to see a large crowd of you fill this auditorium in such a beautiful day. It hit 75 in the city today, and, and uh, smart people were out in the outside doing whatever they, they like to do. So being in here is, is very nice of you. I'm honored to be asked to speak here today. Uh, the Shea Center for Entrepreneurship at Boston College is an amazing opportunity for students and faculty to do some things that have never been done before. So for me to even be part of launching it is really a great honor. Uh, before I begin, a couple housekeeping things I want to hit on and then, and then we'll get into the, the meat of it. And I promise to not be too long because I think it'd be more fun getting some questions and answers going. Uh, first of all, uh, you heard a, an announcement earlier to turn off your devices. Um, I couldn't disagree with them more. <laughs> so if you happen to have an iPhone or an iPad or an Apple Watch, feel free to turn it on, turn up the volume, take notes, take pictures, tweet, vine, periscope, post on your friend's walls, whatever you want to do. I think that's really cool. Um, if, if, if it's not one of the Apple devices I mentioned, yes, keep it away. None of us want to see it. So, um, so that's number one. Number two, uh, if you've ever seen any of the talks I've been like, lucky enough to give, I, I give many speeches and presentations and demos at Apple. Um, you may know that I've never, ever, ever have a speech written. I never work from notes, I never work from an outline, I never have a word written, I don't use teleprompters. I'm lucky enough to have great slides and great products to talk to and I just always talk about what I know. But tonight, I wrote an outline, <laughs> so I never do that. So in advance, if I have to check down to make sure I don't forget something I wrote down for this, I apologize. I, I, I never do that, but tonight I, I broke protocol and did. Uh, and last point I'll make before I get going is um, attire. Uh, I decided to mash together West Coast and East Coast <laughs> in, and, and go a little bit of jacket and jeans because I, I think that's kind of an entrepreneurial look. Um, uh, I think my wife will say I didn't pull it off entirely well, so if, please, I apologize if, if I offend anyone, um, but, but at least give me credit for trying to be entrepreneurial in my attire, um, which is why I would never wear a tie if I didn't have to. Okay, we're using the word entrepreneur, entrepreneurship, entrepreneurial over and over again. Um, I think in the, in the duration of this incredible center, it'll probably be said a trillion times. Um, and that's okay, because I think most people have a general, similar understanding of what an entrepreneur is, what it means. And at the simplest level, it's someone who creates a new business, uh, but doesn't just create a business, has to take on great risk to do so. Taking on risk to create a new business with the hopes of some great upside opportunity uh, on the other end of it. I think that's a pretty, pretty well understood common uh, use of the term. Entrepreneur, obviously, we stole the word from the French, and, uh, but we do that all the time, c'est la vie. And, um, and, and so, so that's cool. Uh, but the word is actually not a, a new word. The word, we think it applies to all the great tech startups and things, but actually the word, as you look it up or you check it up on Wikipedia, which you can, it traces back to the early 1700s. So it has first been used and talked about and spoken. Uh, so it's not surprising that the foundation of the forming of this country was a time when people were talking about entrepreneurial activities and entrepreneurship. It feels like it's uh, the bedrock of the, of the value system of this country. It is an old world. In fact, the, the philosophy of an entrepreneur predates that. And people talk about everything from Jesuits on missions to explorers that opened up trade routes and needed funding to do so, like Marco Polo and many others are talked about as being great entrepreneurs. I don't know where you define that, I leave it to historians, but clearly it's not a new concept and it spans centuries and it spans many different fields and endeavors, which will be a fascinating place uh, to cover here. Some things you think about when you think about a great entrepreneur, a risk taker, an innovator, often a visionary leader, someone who's passionate, someone who's an opportunist, People who take action. I think the word and the idea of taking action fits entrepreneurial activity so well. They're not daydreamers. <laughs> they're not philosophers sitting back dreaming and writing, but not doing. They're taking action to create opportunity. 
And that's part of what enthralls us all so much about entrepreneurs and why we want to be surrounded with them and work with them and be a part of it. Because it's exciting to be part of some action that's happening, some change that's occurring. So that's the other thing I think about when you think about entrepreneurs. They change products, they change markets, they change industries, sometimes they even change the world. I don't know if you've ever heard that line before, gonna change the world, that's, that's something that Apple has certainly uh, been founded on a philosophy of doing that. Uh, you know, I don't know how anyone else feels about this, but I actually think if you looked in the dictionary under entrepreneur, and with all due respect to anyone else, uh, I think there should be a picture of Steve Jobs, right where it says entrepreneur. Um, so hopefully some of you feel the same way. Um, I think Steve was one of the greatest entrepreneurs who, who ever lived. Uh, I certainly believe he's the, he's the greatest entrepreneur I ever had the privilege of, of knowing. Um, he was a boss, a mentor, and a friend to many of us at Apple, and for me personally, for over 15 years. And working alongside Steve, you saw the embodiment of a risk taker, of an innovator, of a visionary leader, of someone who would take incredible risks guiding towards amazing action, certainly a person of action. I think the definition we gave earlier certainly fits him quite well. I, I think if you, as you study entrepreneurship, a name that pops up in a lot of the writing is Joseph Schumpeter. Any of the professors here probably like, yeah, yeah, the, you know, that's in the first week of class. But um, one of these great quotes of, 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 of Mr. Schumpeter's describing an entrepreneur was, the gale of creative destruction. I thought, wow, that's incredibly poetic. Creative destruction, amazing. I think he would have liked Steve quite a lot. That fits so well. Um, at Apple, we had many innovations through the years. And it's a culture of, of entrepreneurial spirit there is so strong. You can just, you can list all, some of them, like the Mac, the iPod, iTunes, QuickTime, uh, the iPhone, iPad, even our retail stores. That's an amazing entrepreneurial activity. The idea of changing the process by which people buy technology, having to invest a great deal to do that, and then forever changing our perception, and now the whole market has to respond and also think about how they do that. I want to talk specifically about uh, one innovation at Apple that uh, has had an impact on literally more than 10 million entrepreneurs creating new opportunities for them. It's the App Store. I'm sure many of you have heard of it. How many people, show of hands here, have an Apple iPhone or iPad or any of our products? Awesome, <laughs> awesome. That is so nice to see, thank you. Um, <laughs> now, I'm gonna ask you to put your hand up again. Like, How many of you who have those devices also have ever downloaded anything from the App Store? Pretty much every hand, in fact, if I asked 10 or 20 or 30 apps, it'd still probably be every hand. The App Store is a remarkable force for entrepreneurial energy. And why? And why? Well, we're gonna talk through that. Now, when we decided to make the App Store for the iPhone, that was back in 2008. And what we thought about right from the start was that we did not want to take the world of software from the PC and move that directly onto iPhone that we needed to do something better. Something better for development, something better for quality, for customer privacy and security, for payment systems and the way you sell things, for the way you distribute things. We needed a different system that was better, and better not just for the largest companies, but for all developers, no matter how young or small, could all take part equally and get access to an amazing growing marketplace. That was what we knew from the beginning we need to do. Now, I know, at least, how many of you are students here currently at BC? Awesome, well first of all, thank you. You're the reason this place is being, being dedicated. This is centers for you, not for us. Uh, so, so I hope this is a, something that you get an amazing experience from. But some of you are probably too young to remember what it was like in the software world way before the App Store. So let me just give you a little glimmer of what that was like and that might shed light on this. Uh, before things like the App Store, if you had an idea, a product or service you want to create, and the best way to express that is through some new software, which is increasingly the way to do it, you needed to create your application or your product. Then 
came the hard part. That was the easy part. The hard part is you'd have to put it on discs, CDs, DVDs. You had to create installer software to get it off of there onto people's computers. You had to put it in a package. You had to cut a deal with a channel, a store, a CompUSA, or Best Buy, or somebody. You had to get them to put it on the shelf. You had to pay detailers to make sure it stayed on the shelf, because if it wasn't on the shelf, you had no sales. If you wanted to market it, you had to pay to be in their flyer on Sunday. You had to pay for an end cap that's at the end of the aisle so people would see your software and maybe you could sell more. And after all that, the poor customer had to get in their car, drive to the store, buy this box, take home a CD, stick it in, run this installer stuff that had lots of bugs, and get to eventually run your software. Now you want to put out your update, guess what? You make your new master, you make your new boxes, you go to the store, the stores make you take all the inventory back, which means you have to refund them all those sales, huge risk, which is part of entrepreneurship, and then the customer has to come to the store and buy it again and take it home and install it just to get an update. That's what it took to be in the software business back before an app store model. And that's just here in the US. Now you wanna grow and become big and become global, you have to set up deals all around the world. You have to set up a deal with a distributor in Europe and a deal with a distributor in Japan and China, on and on. Each distributor would then create the relationships in those stores and the detailers and the end caps and try to get your business going. The truth was, if you're a small developer, that was impossible. This was a system that could only work for the biggest, largest multinational corporations for software, and that's why there were only a few big multinational software corporations. Everyone else walked out of it. That's why we needed a model like the App Store. We needed a way for every developer, the youngest college student who had a brilliant idea, who wanted to reach the world, to be able to easily, quickly write software, put it up on the store, and let the world decide if they have a brilliant new idea and are starting off an incredible new business. And that's what the App Store has enabled. So let me give you a few stats, because this is great in theory, but in practice, what has occurred? And, and it's, it's hard to, to get my head around myself. Number one, the App Store now has over 1.5 million apps on it in 25 unique categories. I mean, that's a huge amount of software. There are about one billion devices that that App Store reaches. So if you have an incredible idea that no one's thought of, you have the opportunity to reach up to a billion devices. There's 850 apps downloaded from the App Store every second. That's amazing. That's more than going through like the turnstiles on the turnpike. It's just, but here's, this, this number really blew me away when we achieved it. It wasn't that long ago that we hit an incredible milestone. The App Store has crossed 100 billion apps downloaded, 100 billion. And that's not with updates and, you know, to existing ones. That's just unique app installs, 100 billion. And everybody is getting in on this. 98% of the Fortune 500 have apps on the App Store. It makes you wonder about the 2% and like why they're so far behind. <laughs> the App Store is available in 155 countries. The ecosystem for the App Store, the developers and the people who create the software, in the US alone has created over 627,000 new jobs. I mean, this is real employment, this is real money, and speaking about the most important metric of all to an entrepreneur, that the App Store has paid out over $33 billion to developers for the software they sell through the store. And the largest part this year alone, it's actually growing in momentum in number of apps, downloads, and money paid to developers. So why go through all this? It really is the greatest source of entrepreneurship and innovation today is the ability to tap into these intelligent devices that everyone's carrying around in their pockets and enable new businesses, new opportunities that didn't exist before. And this is happening everywhere, even right here in the Boston area. <laughs> there are a lot of developers on the App Store. I'll just mention one. If, you, if you're somebody who likes to bike or run, you've probably heard of RunKeeper. They make amazing software for health and fitness, and they're from the Boston area. There, there are developers everywhere. Even our own team at Apple has, has looked at this opportunity to do things and change the world and realized that you can really stretch people's minds uh, with something amazing. And so this example, th this one is, is perhaps one of the most favorite projects I've seen going at Apple and talk about an entrepreneurial idea. A team at Apple has created something called Research Kit. 
If you haven't heard about this, it's remarkable. Research Kit is a library of software for app developers that lets a medical researcher create apps for medical research. Now, if you've ever been involved with medical research and know anything about it, it's a laborious, slow, challenging process. And, and we're all frustrated by certain diseases and discoveries take so long to work their way through research to findings, to providing cures for people. Well, now with Research Kit, medical institutions can create applications and all of us can download them on the App Store to our iPhones or to our watches, to our iPads, and take part in these medical studies, provide data back instantly from around the world, and now millions of people are working together to help find cures for everything from autism to Parkinson's disease. And they use the phone you have and the sensors to help run tests to tell you where you fall in certain factors in the research study group. And you get results back yourself. It's not a blind test. I mean, this is remarkable, changing the way medical research is done through something as simple as the App Store. And that's what we think about when we talk about entrepreneurial activity, the ability to change the world, change markets, change the way things are done with a unique, brilliant, creative idea. And that's what's open to everybody. So entrepreneur is a 300-year-old term. The reality is it's a field that predates that by centuries. But I think there's no question that it is the most amazing time right now, the best time in history to be an entrepreneur. And clearly today is the perfect time to open up a center for entrepreneurship at Boston College because the opportunities are boundless. So that's it. That's my opening uh, remarks and how I wanted to kick things off. And I think the next part is we'd like to really get into questions and answers and open this up for a lot more fun dialogue. So, Jerry. Fantastic. Thank you. Wow, what a, what a keynote, Phil. I mean, just amazing. There probably isn't anybody that has affected entrepreneurship coming out of Boston College than, than Phil Schiller. Uh, came all the way out here, flew out this morning, uh, yeah. dedicating so much of your time and an incredible speech. I'd like to give another round of applause. It was fantastic. Thank you. Thank you. And we're going we're gonna to bring up our other, our other two pan, uh, panelists uh, now. We're going to go into the panel side, side of this. Um, I'd like to introduce uh, Bijan Sabe right here to my right. Bijan's a uh, BC class of 91, lives right here in Boston and Weston, um, and uh, is another incredible BC grad who's done so much for entrepreneurship. Bijan started uh, Spark Capital in 2005 and uh, was the first money in a, on a little company that you may have heard of called Twitter. Twitter. And so he funded Twitter <coughs> in 2008 mm -hmm. and sat on the board uh, for three years. Uh, so that was, uh, if you can imagine, we'll talk to him about that, uh, an, an amazing opportunity. With a, yes, I just took a panoramic photograph. <laughs> And Bijan's also back companies such as many that we all know here and use, Tumblr, uh, which we, you're on the board there, and then you sold to Yahoo, uh, CrowdRise, uh, Stack Exchange, also RunKeeper. So Phil gave him a little plug there. Thank you. So sir. many of the leading uh, entrepreneur ventures and uh, started right here in Boston by a BC grad. And uh, it's wonderful to have you, and thank you for coming today, Thanks Bijan. Also, my good friend, uh, Nerd Shah, uh, in the middle. Nerd, uh, feeling a little bad, he didn't go to BC, he's a graduate <laughs> of Cornell, but it's a pretty good school. And he's a great friend of mine, so he's come today. Nerge is the uh, co-founder of a company called Wayfair. Uh, Wayfair is one of the great success stories of Boston, just went public last year. It is uh, by far the largest retailer of home furnishing online. Last year you did sales of $1.3 billion. Um, and is higher, it's funny, I said to, to Nerds, did you know that BC students are going to visit your company tomorrow? Tech Trek is going to Wayfair. You didn't know, he offered, you did that five or six years ago and you've done it every year, students going and, and visiting. He said he's recruiting quite a few uh, MBAs and undergrads from BC, so you can you know, email him, and tweet, tweet him. <laughs> come, come on over tomorrow. <laughs> uh, but he's a lifelong uh, entrepreneur and also from here in Boston. So we're really fortunate to have a great panel uh, I'm going to ask a few questions to get things rolling, um, and uh, then we're going to open up to the audience as well. If you have a question, at some point we'll, we'll open up. You can go to the center, and uh, there's a mic, and you can ask a question yourself. So let's start. We're, we're here at, at BC with the Entrepreneurship Center. What role do universities play in, in this 
education of the young people for, uh, for entrepreneurship, you know, for teaching entrepreneurs? Where, where, where do you see, you know, BC and other universities? What, what's important here? You want to start? Or go ahead, we'll put you on the spot. Sure. <clears throat> you know, I, I think there's actually a huge role for universities to play. And so I, um, I've had the same co-founder, a fellow named Steve Conine, who went to Cornell with me, but his younger brother, Matt Conine, went to Boston College. And uh, we actually, through Matt, we met uh, Professor Mary Cronin, who's here, who I saw a little while ago. She was actually an advisor to us in our first company, so I don't know if you knew that. But I did know that. Um, Jerry knows everything is the thing, so yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's hard to, hard to get an edge, but you know. The, uh, so the, the, the thing, when we were at Cornell, there was one undergraduate entrepreneurship course, and we just happened to take it as an elective our last semester. And you know, both Steve and I are, are entrepreneurial type folks, but without that one course, I don't know if we would have accidentally fell into being an entrepreneur right, right then, right out of college. And, and today, you know, there's, there's a lot more opportunities for students in college to learn about what it takes to start a company or how companies work or to get access to different sort of disciplines to learn, you know, all the different skills together that would create. And, and I think that all of that makes a huge difference because you have a lot of people with ambition to be an entrepreneur but sometimes need some help in terms of learning what it would take. And anything that facilitates that is going to be great for the economy because entrepreneurs tend to create things and build new things, and, and Phil, just, you're talking about it, you just start thinking about the app store, you're thinking about all the folks who've created these apps, and then you, you hear about all these success stories, and it, without the app store, as a, for example, as a source of removing friction, a bunch of them would not have existed, right? So I, I think universities can play that huge role. John, what you Yeah, I mean, I, I totally agree. I mean, clearly there are exceptions of companies that were started outside of a university setting, or, you know, companies that, you know, people have dropped out, but, by and large, most of these businesses, you know, get started where, you know, the entrepreneur really gets um, what they need out of the university. They get community, they get, you know, endless uh, learning opportunities. It's a place to really explore your passions, to collaborate with others. I mean, you know, we just see that time and time again, you know, co-founders coming together, meeting in undergrad, meeting in graduate school. They have a chance to do work together, experiments together, try on new things. Um, we see it all the time. So. You know, Phil, when you were here, there was no entrepreneurship center, and uh, you're one of the great entrepreneurs to come out of BC. You were a bio major, you know. So, do you have to study? Bio Someone laughed. Other than that. <laughs> <laughs> bio major. <laughs> do, you, do you have to? You know, if, if you're sitting in the audience today, do you have to take entrepreneurial classes to be an entrepreneur? Or? Um, no, of course not. It's but 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 certainly there's a lot of ways they can help. For me, the 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 skill I gained from BC that that's been the most useful for my whole life and career has been. Um, not any specific subject, but the, the knowledge of how to learn. Because the one guarantee is whatever path you start on, it's going to change. It's going to take a turn, whether it's yourself and your own choices or the world around you ch changing. And you need to adapt and you have to move fast. And, and if you know that you have the confidence that you can learn whatever you need to learn for that next step and change with it and move quickly, then that's a huge asset. And not everyone understands that and gets how to do that. And that's why I'm a big fan of a liberal arts education in general. I think one of the great benefits is the knowledge that you can learn many subjects and find fascination in many things. And, and you know, for me, yes, I was a bio major, but I was, took a, a computer class while I was here as an elective. I took geophysics as an elective. I took uh, oceanography as an elective. I took an art class as an elective. And, the ability to branch out and stretch your brain and learn these different th disciplines uh, are probably the most valuable tool you take with you. And I think, you know, as you think about entrepreneurship, it, it touches all those components as well, right? So it doesn't really, you know, it, does, it isn't just about, you know, launching an online business or launching a, a, a micro blogging business. I mean, entrepreneurs are in every dimension. Um, let's talk a little bit. We heard so much about Edmund Shea and how much he's given back to the entrepreneurial ecosystem over his life. We have a lot of alumni here. What's the responsibility of, of alumni and the community to help students, to help budding entrepreneurs? I know you all give back a ton. You're here today, you've had students to your office, you've, you know, you've done so much for young people. Do we have a responsibility as alumni to give back to BC? How can people that are here, a lot of alumni here do that? What, what do you, what's your? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I absolutely, yes. Uh, giving back is, is, is critical and, and you know, it, 
and I'm, I'm so inspired because we're seeing more and more of that. I, I, I kind of feel like with each generation, every group that comes out of BC, every uh, new uh, generation of entrepreneur, I, I see people giving back way more than even in the previous generations. You know, you have accelerator programs where people can get involved. You know, here in Boston, we have this program called Techstars. We see successful entrepreneurs getting involved. We see, you know, people giving uh, a lot of their time and energy, doing seed investing, advisory work, coming into BC, teaching classes, judging uh, VC competitions. I mean, it just seems to be, um, you know, just getting supercharged. And it's, it's critical and it's exciting to see. And, you know, coming back in the classroom, I, I think you've been to Mary's class, haven't you? Uh, there was a t that you, you did yes. the tape. From, you know, I mean, how, how much fun is that, right, to come into a classroom? And, and, and that's a lot of people who do it, they say they get more out of it than the students even do. It's definitely a lot of fun. I, you know, I also think that um, it's one of the, th you know, just if you take a step back and you just look broadly, I think one of the things that makes, you know, just the United States such a great place to be, right, is this land of opportunity. Well, it's land of opportunity because anyone can, can do anything. I mean, you know, there's a rule of law and there's all these things, but part of it's just this environment, which is like, it's a very supportive place and people work with all kinds of other folks. They learn from all kinds of other folks and giving back to me is part of that full circle, you know, and I, don't, that's, I think you benefit from folks helping you and you get, you, it, you give back, it helps them, but then to your point, you know, you enjoy it. You know, you see gratification because you're able to help someone else out. You know? Yeah, it's really, it, it is a lot of fun. How about mentorship? You know, one of the other thing we talk about here to our students is get mentors, find mentors. You know, how, how were mentors important in your careers? Did you have a mentor, Phil? I'm sure you did. And you could maybe tell us a little about that. And also, how as a young person do you, do you get a mentor? How do you find a mentor? And, and how do you, how do you uh, seek that person out? Well, I definitely had the probably greatest mentor I could have ever had was, was Steve Jobs, and, and that was uh, something that certainly changed my life. Uh, but in general, I think there are a lot of opportunities for students to get mentorship. It starts right with your professor, right? These, these people have been all vetted and picked for you to be some of the brightest people that can help guide you at this point in your life, and, and they're wonderful mentors. There's a lot of places for interaction with alumni and others. Um, through different programs. I'm a, I'm a huge fan of Tech Trek. Professor Gallagher's program is probably one of the greatest uh, business programs in the United States today. If, 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 you're, if you're not fighting to get a spot in that, you should. It's wonderful. So that's a great opportunity to meet every year both undergraduate and graduate students uh, as they travel the country. Um, there are uh, technology councils. There's an East Coast and a West Coast Technology Council. I've been a member of the West Coast Technology Council since it started, and it's a for those of us out there, if, if you're back on vacation, you can go to the meetings and inter interface and meet with people. And then, and then I think um, probably the, the thing that can help uh, students the most is summer internships. Take what you learn throughout the year and then go do something in the summer where you can apply that and get experience and meet people in the business world. And, and so opportunities to do that are fantastic. You know, that tech track is exactly what's happening tomorrow at, at, at your company, uh, Nerds at Wayfair, a, a local tech track. They go out on Friday afternoon to visit local companies. And, uh, I think there's about 30 or 40 BC undergrads and MBA students coming, coming out to see you, and I know you've been so generous with your time. What about mentors for you? Have you, have you uh, had some mentors really influenced your life? Or? Yeah, you know, <clears throat> what I would say to that, the, the answer is definitely yes. And, and what I've found is that in a lot of different situations, you just learn a lot of different things from different folks. So in, in my case, rather than it being one person who I'd say is just you know, kind of clearly the person I've learned the most from, there's been a series of a few different folks. And some of the things you learn, and this is um, part of the beauty of, of entrepreneurship, is you, know, you can get into something knowing uh, very little about it, and it can still work out well if you're sort of like always willing to learn, always willing to listen. And I think a lot of times you, know, you learn through experience. And so a lot of the, the great examples I've had that have ended up, you know, in hindsight, you say, well, who's a good mentor? And th these are the folks that would pop to mind are basically situations where you just have someone who has a lot more experience with something than you, and so their ability to, 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 to see patterns or their ability to know how to interact with people in certain situations or whatever, just far more honed than yours are. And so as long as you're always willing to listen, you can learn. And so to your point about, you know, how do you find mentors and, and Phil's answer about, you know, and, you know, hey, one of the things that you can also help yourself with are summer internships. I think anytime you put yourself in situations like that or other situations where they're just different, you're getting exposed to different things, and you're working with people who happen to know something quite well, you have the opportunity to learn. So I, I think it's just always just being a sponge just helps you out tremendously. Well, speaking of being a sponge, we talked about, you know, 
taking risks and, and getting outside your comfort zone. You know, and, and I think one of the things that I've, I've tried to instill here at BC the last year or so is to get students thinking about trying new things. I think BC in general has been, for the last 30 years, 40 years, pretty conservative with a lot of the kids coming out. They, have, they want a good job and work in bank and consulting, big companies. You know, and at 22 years old, I mean, what's the big, what, what, if you can put yourself back to that age, when you, when you thought about what you were gonna do, you know, what, how did you think about taking a risk? What, you, you went out to John of the West Coast, right? Can, you, you know, can you, I remember you talked a little bit about this last time we were together. Can you talk a little bit about when, you know, when you were coming out of Boston College and how you formed up what you wanted to do and did you play it safe or take a risk and why? Yeah, I mean, it, it was different then. I mean, we were banging rocks together to make fire back in those days, but like, you know, like, you know, we, for me, it was a bit of a, of a journey and I wasn't sure what I wanted to do. I got turned down from a lot of jobs, frankly, when I was coming out. I ended up joining this little software company that Mitch Kapoor started in Cambridge called On Technology. Um, and then I met, um, I met this girl <laughs> and, and followed her out to California. She was a, she's a BC grad. We're married 20 years now. And um, Good decision. <laughs> yeah, she, she, I was a dorky guy. My roommate's here. We were both dorks. I, I married a cheerleader. And, and I make sure we go to every reunion <laughs> possible. <laughs> you know? um, and, um, but I guess the, the risk that you know, I took you know, in, in taking risk is like you know, trying things that you know, feel scary. You know, I had never lived on the West Coast. I packed everything I owned in the back of my hatchback and drove 3,000 miles um, and got to California five days later and worked for a company doing embedded operating systems. I didn't know anything about embedded operating systems. And, and um, when you know, my first startup got going, I was one of the early people at Web TV. Like, I didn't know anything about startups. I didn't know anything about venture capital. Um, you know, when we raised our firm 10 years ago this summer, I, I knew exactly zero about venture capital, <laughs> investing venture capital, but I had great mentors and great partners. Um, so I think life is about taking uh, risk and, and, and trying new things on. And, and you know, there's gonna, you're going to make mistakes along the way, and uh, I think those are the best learning opportunities. Phil, how about you? What, what, how did you end up where you were and what the risks you took along the way? Oh, I don't think we have enough time here for all of that. But <laughs> Um, yeah, it is all about risk taking and, and changing. And um, I was a, 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 a biology major studying molecular biology, and went to graduate school for molecular biology, and decided that isn't you know making uh, four-legged newts in a lab wasn't exactly what I wanted to do. So yeah, I, you think I'm kidding? We were like you can make a, a newt grow extra legs off of one arm and, and stuff uh, with DNA. But um, we were we were doing <laughs> yeah, we were doing crazy stuff. It was the good old days. Um, but um, so I came back, and 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 you know, um, you know, fear is a great motivator. I'm a big believer of that too. So figuring out, oh my goodness, what do I do now for the rest of my life? I have to get a job, and and trying to find something to build off of some experiences I had had at BC. I said I took a computer class, took a bunch of statistics classes too, and that helped me. Um, but uh, but I'll share one really funny one. So when I came back, I was trying to figure out what I wanted to do. I got a job. Uh, working in a lab at Mass General Hospital doing, you know, gel electrophoresis and x-ray lithography and stuff. And I was looking for a computer job. And I actually drove up to Wang. Now, kids play, probably don't know who that is, but us <laughs> older people do. And I tried to get a job running the tape mach machines for the computer systems at night on the night shift, and I couldn't. Right? They wouldn't hire me without experience. I thought, you're kidding me. I'm, I just have to stand there all night and put a tape up on the tape reel. And I can't, get, nope, not experienced enough. So it was really hard getting that first job in technology and, and getting started. And, and I feel for anybody who's beginning. So that's why I'm a big believer of the summer internship. Like, get going before you have to make that your, how you make ends meet. And, and it's tough, but, uh, but I found a way through it. And, well, it's funny, you know, we, some of these questions that you ask the students to submit them, and one of the questions is around, you know, look, I'm not, I, I'm not a technical person. You know, I, I don't take programming. We don't have a school of engineering. You know, I'll never get a job at Apple or at Wayfair or at, at Twitter. You know, what, what do I have to do, you know, to, to, to get a job in a technical company if, I'm not a te if I don't have a technical background? Well, you should apply to Wayfair because we'll, we'll hire you. <laughs> <laughs> so that, that's the first thing you that, need that to do. That may not be the right decision. So come by tomorrow. No, uh, so, no, but, you know, it's actually so, uh, look, you know, certainly being appreciative of technology and, and understanding, and even if you, you know, if you learn a little bit of how the basics of programming work, those help you in things. But to be honest, you know, a lot of technology companies today do a lot more than just software development. You know, software development's a piece of it, but 
you have great designers, you have product managers who are blending sort of an understanding of what they want to build with consumer interests. We have marketers and we have merchants and we, you know, we're, we're actually, we're a retailer, right? Is really what our business is, but powered very heavily by technology everywhere. But the key to being really successful there isn't necessarily knowing how to build the technology. There's a, there's a lot of roles where people who are super successful building the technology. But the key is understanding the technology broadly enough to be able to think about how it can be used and that creativity. So I think now is an amazing time to be, you know, getting involved with, with the internet and internet technologies. I think it's still super early. You know, I think there's gonna, you're going to look back and it's going to be like this 40-year period where everything changed and we're like approaching the halfway point maybe, you know, is the way I think about it. I don't, I don't know if you guys would agree or not. I still, I still think there's a lot more ahead. And you don't need to, you, you, you shouldn't be intimidated if you don't know how to code. I, I don't think so. I don't think you need to be intimidated at all. I do think it, it's like anything else. Like my, my uh, I, have a, I have two kids and one, one of them, my son is almost 11. He, you know, he is, you know, kind of a math guy. He's more, more like I am in, in terms of, you know, self-taught and computers or whatever, excited by it. But he taught himself a lot of stuff just on Khan Academy, and he doesn't really know how to code per se, but it just like helps you with a way of thinking. So I, I don't think you should be intimidated at all if you don't know how to code, but I would say there's benefit to exposing yourself to it a little bit, just how, how the thing goes. But to be honest, the biggest thing is just the creativity of understanding how to use technology. That's like the first thing that matters the most. And I, I think just being an enthusiast and being aware of what's happening gets you really far, you know, really, really far. This isn't directly the answer to your question, but let me turn it around the other way. I think everybody should learn to code. I think everybody should try to learn to code. Doesn't mean you're going to become a programmer as your career, but um, we were, some of us were talking about this beforehand. You know, when I grew up, and many of you, we had to learn French in middle school, or in science, we had to learn Latin. Never used it again, but you had to learn it. And um, I think today everybody should learn to code. It's sort of like ratatouille. Everybody can cook, not everybody will be a cook. Everybody can code, not everybody will be a coder. And, uh, and I think that's true. If you want to have an understanding of the terminology, you want to have a little bit of awareness of the process, software touches practically every business today, whether it's a technology field or not. And, and to have an understanding of it, have some experience of it, and it, is, is, it gives you a leg up, and increasingly it gets you to the same level as everybody else. Uh, I, I think it's crazy to decide to not take a, a programming class. Uh, again, not to say that you're trying to change your life and that everybody has to be a programmer. Have some understanding. You can I, I think it's the smart thing to do. Why wouldn't you want to learn? And a lot of it, like you said, can be self-taught too. I mean, you, the course is I, here. I'm trying to say the same thing Phil said, but he's just much clearer at articulating <laughs> than I am. Bijan, you agree? You agree with that? I, I absolutely do. I mean, I oftentimes meet people and they say, "Hey, I'm not technical. How am I going to start a company or a product?" And, and my typical response is, "If you're not technical, get technical." I mean, you know, I mean, we, we back Dennis Crowley, who started Foursquare. Before Foursquare, he built uh, this product called Dodgeball that Google bought. Dodgeball was an app and Dennis showed me the code, it was 1,400 if-then else statements. I mean, like, 1,400 if-then else statements. I mean, it, it was just a hack of all hacks, but like, you know, it got working, and uh, you know, he, he uh, took a couple programming classes at, uh, at ITP over at NYU, and he got technical. I mean, you know, could that code last for, you know, 10 million users? Definitely not, but it inspired him to uh, raise some seed capital from some angels. It inspired a, a technical co-founder to say, hey, this is worth that person's time. It inspires other people in the company to say, hey, I want to get behind this idea. Um, you know, even if you want to go into product or design, to have that aptitude to understand, you know, what these things are built. I mean, there's nothing worse than a product manager that doesn't understand the product, and now he's got to, or she's got to work with engineers, and you don't really understand, um, you know, the scope of the effort. Um, so I, I, I think it's, it's, it's really critical. Um, and, and if you're not technical, just, just go get technical. Yeah. So... We talked, we heard a little bit, Phil, you talked about what you think makes great entrepreneurs, the risk taking, you take action. Let's talk a little bit more about that. What, what, do, you, what do you look for in entrepreneurs? What, 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 a, what is the, the, the thing that makes the best entrepreneur? What, what did Steve Jobs have that, that no one else had or no one else had as good as he did? Well, that's two di very different questions. It's a high standard. <laughs> what makes an entrepreneur and then what does Steve have? So, so uh, I think 
when you're looking for people who are entrepreneurial, you're looking for people who are, I think, um, aggressive in their thought process. They really are looking for, you know, at, for example, at Apple, we, we never set our goal as doing a certain number of things. We want to do a million of those or 10 million. No, we do it about, we want to do the best. What will make the best phone ever made? What will make the best store experience anyone's ever had? That's what we set our goals as. The numbers are a byproduct of trying to be the best. And so you're looking for people that understand how to set that barometer. What is the best? What have others done? What's been done before? What would make it better? What do customers want to make it better? This incredible in inquisitive mind, intuitive understanding of what makes something better, and then a desire to go do everything possible to make that happen. And incredible self-honesty to admit when um, when you're not doing well and you need help and, and you need others to assist you, but you haven't lost sight of the goal, and, and probably being fairly egoless. You see some people in, in this industry that have very big egos, get those out of the way, because if the goal is to do something, an entrepreneur, like I said, this is an action thing, it's about getting something done. It's not about you, it's about that thing. And so get all the ego out of the way and, 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 and ask for help. So those are traits we look at when I talk to people are, how aggressive are you in your thinking? How smart are you and where you're trying to get to? How much is this about the, the thing you're trying to do versus you personally? And are you self-honest and willing to ask for help when you need it? Great. John, how about you? What do you look for when you look at the founders for the entrepreneurial, you know, the deep down DNA, what is it? Well, I mean, you know, I, I don't know if this is known, but we're proud investors in Neeraj's company. Um, so, you know, we look for people like Neeraj. Uh, you know, I, I mean, we, we really look for people that have, you know, a vision uh, for what they want to accomplish, you know, a tireless pursuit of, of going after that vision and wanting to make a real difference. Um, and then, you know, the credibility that they can actually go do that. And, and to do that is, you know, inspire people to join the team and to go out and, and, and really try to build something that can, uh, you know, be durable and everlasting. And, and that, that's kind of what we look at. Sometimes it's people that are experienced and seasoned like, you know, Neeraj, we're lucky enough to get involved with Neeraj's company after he, he had built it with his partner for a period of time. Sometimes it's a 19 year old David Karp, um, but you just, you see that same uh, characteristics and, uh, and that's when we, um, we get excited and, and try to get involved. Should you, should you, you know, there's a lot of students here and they have their ideas. A lot of them come to me and show a new app they're gonna do. You know, we, we kind of, I've said a lot, I don't know, but the Vassant, the, the Vassant Research Center is not about starting your own company, it's about, about teaching you how to be an entrepreneur and get ready to, to go work in a startup. How do you guys feel about that? Is that, should, should we be saying that or should you be starting companies out of college or in college or, you know, what, what is, what's your thought on that? Any of you guys want to Any, Anybody? Anybody have a strong opinion on it? Or? Absolutely yes. It's the, you know, the time to take the risk is when you're young, go, go go explore your ideas. See if you have that next brilliant thing. Go try and do it. Get some help, and 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 you know, and if you if you if you find that that's not the path, great. There are lots of paths, but it's easier to try when you're younger. So so now in time. col in, in, at BC in college, if you have an idea, cook it up in your dorm room and go for it. Carpe diem. <laughs> yes, absolutely. Yeah. You know, we were, you're talking about traits of great entrepreneurs. The number one, most of all is a passion, a love for that thing, whatever that thing you're interested in is. So if you, if, if you, doesn't matter what age you are, if you're in high school, if you're in college, if you're in grad school, if you have something that just drives you, you're so passionate about, absolutely go try to create that idea and, and see where it takes you. You know, we talk about passion a lot actually, and we say, and the students say, well, how do I figure out what my passion is? You know, I don't know, and I, I, I talk a little about who you admire the most, you know, who are the people that inspire you. How did you know what your passion was? How, as you came out of BC, where did you figure out what you wanted to do? What was the moment you did, you know, that you, the light bulb went on and said, I want to be a venture capitalist, or I want to start my own e-commerce company, I'm going to build Apple into the greatest computer company there is? It, it's whatever you get excited about. I mean, it's, it's, it's pretty, I, I think it becomes pretty obvious because, it, I mean, everyone has things they do in their life that they're more excited about and things that you do that you're less excited about and you run across opportunities and some opportunities you get really excited about. And you have ideas, what you, you know, if, if I ask you guys, okay, what are you doing this weekend? What's the most exciting thing you have planned for the next month? Most people can answer that question. Well, that's what they're passionate about. That's what they're excited about. So it's, it's, it's not dissimilar to that, I think. 
Yeah, I, I agree. I mean, at, at college, it's this really unique opportunity. You know, in high school, you kind of have a curriculum that's fairly rigid, or at least where I went to school, and, you know, you, you just kind of follow that along. But as Phil was talking about, I mean, you can do so many things in undergrad. You know, I, I took a philosophy course. I took a photography course. I took a computer science class. I mean, you can just, you know, figure it out, and, and you'll, you can make the time to go do it. And I, I think the other piece is, like, you don't have to come up with the world's greatest idea by some contrived date. I mean, that's not the assignment. I think the assignment is to, you know, pursue your passion. And if you don't have the idea, you know, get passionate about, you know, somebody else's idea and team up with that person. I mean, I, I don't think, uh, you know, the onus is on you tomorrow to create the next Apple. I mean, I think it'd be great. Um, but, like, you know, if you meet somebody and want to team with them and, and help them and bring your own uh, inc skills that, that they don't have, um, you know, the Beatles was, was John and Paul. I mean, you know, it, 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 it takes more than uh, one person to build something magical, and, um, and that's okay, too. That, that's quite great. Let's shift a little bit to talk a little about social entrepreneurship. Well, you know, BC, Judge Education, Men and Women for Others. How important is it for us to, to help in the social entrepreneurship side of things, and, and, and how different is social entrepreneurship than, you know, for-profit entrepreneurship? Is there, you know, logical say there really isn't a lot of difference in the type of people and the way you run your enterprise. It's just one wants, you know, to do one thing, one wants to do another. Have you had any, any interactions with social entrepreneurs? What do you say to a yeah. social entrepreneur who comes in and, and is pitching your, their idea to you? Well, I, I don't know if this is a change. I mean, we've been doing this for 10 years, not, you know, longer, so I, I don't have a, a big perspective, but we have seen an increasing number of people, of founders that come in that have a very strong desire to, to make a real difference in the world. And, and so at Twitter, right from the beginning, they had this thing called Twitter for Good, where they allocated uh, people's time, employees' time, to go out and, and do uh, charitable work on behalf of Twitter. You know, we've seen, we've backed a company called CrowdRise. It's a company, it's a for-profit company, but it's all about raising money for nonprofits and a crowdfunding platform. And the founders are emotionally attached to the idea of helping charities. I mean, like, that's what, you know, they want to do. We've seen a number of companies now, like Kickstarter and others, that have really pushed and evangelized this notion of a, of a, a Class B company as, uh, as opposed to a, a C Corp. Uh, sorry, a B Corp company as opposed to uh, a C Corp. As, as a way to tell shareholders, like, hey, social good is, is part of the way we should be judged. You know, it's not just on, um, on, on profits and, and revenue. And so you'll see some companies that actually become public companies that are B Corp corporations that, you know, they're telling their shareholders um, what to expect for them. So I, I think we're increasingly seeing this as, as uh, you know, it's, it's becoming a, a critical part of, of, uh, of what these companies are all about. And then the thing we care about is, is like we really believe that the best entrepreneurs have, have a pure mission and they're not, you know, it's like mission versus a mercenary culture. And, 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 and that's where we, we tend to find ourselves attracted to. It goes back to that passion, right? right? I mean, at the end of the day, that's, you know. What are you doing at Wayfair uh, with social entrepreneurship? Or do you have anything on, from a company-wide standpoint or if an employee comes to you and talks to you about doing something? Yeah, so, <coughs> what we, so we do... The way we work is so as a company we do a little bit right so we're we have a national partnership with Habitat for Humanity and we have a series of other things we do but the bulk of what we do is actually based on what the people in the company want to get involved in so the way we tend to think about it is rather than as a company making decisions of what we do instead we think about it as like look you know all a company is is it's basically a collection of people organized around some common goal that everyone got excited about right who then you know you kind of figure out what your priorities are to try to achieve that goal and in our in our case our business is right we're trying to take care of a customer and so we organize our activities around the goal but the, po the point is that we've you know so we've amassed 3,000 people who are organized on the goal well those 3,000 people we think are incredibly talented they can go work wherever they want to work and they, they have all these skills that we think are incredibly valuable and they have a life which is balanced between things they want to do with their family and things that they do career-wise and things that they want to learn and things ways they want to give back and so what we do is we're organized a lot around supporting causes that people in the company get involved in, and then we try to use the resources of the company to help, to help push those forward. And the, those resources are basically time and money. So those are the two things we do. And so there's different things, and we, we as a company organize none of these, but um, there's a group uh, that's headquartered in town called Citizen Schools, which is basically helps in, in public schools outside of the school day, it fills in the afternoon from the 2 or 3 p.m. dismissal until about 6 p.m. in a lot of um, sort of uh, disadvantaged areas, partners with middle schools, and creates programs where these students get exposure to a lot of, of folks they wouldn't otherwise get exposure to, or you know, engineers and doctors and, and all kinds of folks come in and speak, but then 
writing is a big part of the curriculum that a lot of these uh, students don't have great access to folks to help coach them and, and, and teach them on how to make their writing better. So we have about 80 uh, folks in the company who volunteered where these folks, the, the, the students, the middle schoolers, come in to the company in the afternoon. I think it's once a week for a period of like 15 weeks and then, and then we rotate. And they have a mentor who actually sits with them for a couple hour period. And, and this is all coming from the employees of Wayfair. Exactly. They're, so their with, ideas, they're passionate about it. Two, they two employees volunteered for this and then they recruited others and it just sort of grew. And so that, you know, what we do as a company is really basic, right? We give people time, we financially support these causes, we make our office space available and things like that. But we don't, we don't you know, the truth is really what we're doing is we're really just supporting the people in the company who find ways that they want to give back that they feel you know, obviously they get the gratification, but they also feel like they're making an impact. They, they're picking how they're going to allocate their time and ways they can make an impact. That's, that's our, our philosophy is more about supporting our people and the causes they pick rather than us as a company being uh, deciding. I know Apple does it so much. I mean, are you, is it structured the same way? We're no, um, this is actually, people ask me a lot about how Apple's different uh, today uh, under Tim Cook, uh, following up on Steve and and one of the great things is, is Tim, I really think of as a social entrepreneur. It's remarkable how much he's driving. And without reducing our focus on products, adding um, an agenda to Apple of taking part in important, uh, important social issues that matter to us. And, and there's four in particular that we have major efforts on. Uh, one is the environment. Uh, another is diversity. Third is education, our role in, uh, in education. And, um, oh my goodness, I'm going to blank on the fourth. Oh, it'll come back to me in one second. So, um, so on, on the environment, it's reducing um, harmful pollutants and products and in the pipeline of all the projects that, that people work on. And it's building the world's largest private solar farms. We've been doing that. It's creating all data centers that are completely off the grid and self-sustaining. A bunch of work around things like that. Um, in diversity, there's great causes we're taking up there uh, that have mattered a lot, and our employees are helping to drive a lot of that too. There's, there's, uh, but it, but um, it crosses over into education um, with, uh, there's a, a project headed by uh, Obama uh, called uh, Connect Ed, uh, try to invest in underprivileged schools to bring technology and mentorship to uh, students that might not have access and opportunity, and so investing um, in that. So we have just a number of very specific focused activities where we don't want to just talk about it. We want to do something uh, to change uh, some major social causes and issues. And to do that, we've even hired an executive uh, 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 employee at Apple, uh, Lisa Jackson, who is the former head of the EPA, uh, to, to help uh, take what were disparate efforts around Apple and bring them together into very big focused efforts. And, and, it's, and it's been amazing. It's fantastic. And, and just uh, so you all know, uh, we're going to do this all over again uh, in the middle of March around social entrepreneurs. We're going to have a symposium for social innovation here on campus. And um, we're really looking forward to that. And uh, so put that on your calendar. I think it's the 20, we're hoping it's 20, pencil in, 22nd of March. Um, we're going to uh, open it up to the floor in a minute. So if you have a question, you can go up to the center. And uh, I think that's Julie Kelly back there. Is it? Yeah, they'll have the mic. Um, and while you're thinking about a question or uh, taking the risk to go up and ask the question, um, I, I gotta ask, East Coast, West Coast. You know, I mean, what, what's the? Is there? Is there all? You know, everyone, you know, oh, you gotta go. The, the, it's all happening on the West Coast. I mean, you you spend time going back and forth. You know, fill your out the West Coast. I know you travel a lot. You have your business here in Boston. What's the difference? Is there a difference? Does it mean? Does it mean? Is it a big deal? Yes. <laughs> this is not hurting anyone's feelings, but yes, there's a huge difference. What's the difference? <laughs> there is a unique culture for entrepreneurship and investment in entrepreneurs on the West Coast that's unique in the world. And I think it's one of the great assets of the US. I actually wish more of the country realized that this is a wonderful asset we have as a nation and, and, and it's not about a regional competitiveness, it's just a great resource. And these things happen around the country and certainly happen in, in Boston and happen in New York um, but nothing really has the, 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 the vibe of it that you have when you're on Sand Hill Ave in Palo Alto, you know, in stone's throw from Stanford, and you see the, all of the people involved in the process and 
the support system there. It's just, it is a different thing. And maybe it's the weather, maybe it's the rolling hills, I don't know, but it's, um, but there is a difference, I, in my opinion. What do you think, Dijon? Yeah, I mean, look, I, I, I lived there for a while. I, half of our investments are there. I'm, I was there yesterday. <laughs> I'm there every three weeks dutifully. I mean, so it is a, it is a unique place. Um, I, I guess the few things I guess I'd call out in contrast in, in, uh, in Boston's defense or just to kind of call a spade a spade, I guess, first of all, like this is just a smaller place, just it's physically smaller. You know, if you, if you consider Silicon Valley to be, you know, maybe, I don't know, San Jose to San Francisco, like it's just a, it's a bigger footprint, people, et cetera. So, so to some extent, you know, that's a, that's a thing. I, I think, I think, but I, what I, I, I think happened here also is we had a culture of conservatism. I mean, I think there was a risk aversion. I remember, you know, people often asking me like, "Hey, how old are you? Where'd you go to school? What'd you study, etc." And when I got to Silicon Valley, it was kind of like, "Hey, what you working on?" You know, and, um, and and there was a really significant mindset in New York. You know, we started investing in New York. Our startups couldn't hire engineers. They would either go to Silicon Valley, or they would work for Wall Street, and that was in 2005. You know, in 08, when the whole financial crisis started happening in 09, certainly, like the stigma of working for Wall Street was real. And so, like going home to Thanksgiving and saying, you know, I, I work for Goldman Sachs, didn't have the same, you know, patina. <laughs> so, <laughs> you, you would either, you know, go to Silicon Valley or you'd work for an awesome tech startup. And and so, I, I think this is really changing. You know, we're seeing people uh, look what's happening here at BC. This is this is a change. Like this is amazing. You know, and if uh, you know, we're seeing faculty get involved in startups now. This stuff didn't happen. You know, certainly when I was living here as an undergrad student, or when I when I moved back to Boston. So, you know, I think the West Coast will continue to do extraordinary things. But but we're seeing change. You know, we would never have invested in Los Angeles uh, when we started. We thought there was no tech in LA. It was just a bunch of uh, Hollywood people at best. And. You know, we invested in Oculus in, in Southern California. It was one of our best investments. Extraordinary tech talent. You know, Facebook moved them all to Los Angeles, but I mean, all to Menlo Park. But, you know, we, we have great things going on in New York, what Neeraj is building here in Boston. I mean, they're doing it all in downtown Boston, by the way. It's not like in this Route 128 uh, corridor. I mean, you know, he's got 3,000 people in, in, um, in the back bay. I mean, I, I, I think, I think we're, we're going we're gonna to make a run for it. I, I really do. I mean, you started a company here, Nerds, and now you've, you're one of the great success stories. T tell us, you know, why did you do it here? You know, wh why did you stay here? Has it, has, has it, sure. has so it changed much since you started it? I think basically everything that's been said is true. There's a piece that hasn't been said, though, that I think is the other piece of the puzzle. So I do think the East Coast is more conservative, Boston's more conservative. I think that's held Boston back from, from you know, being as productive as it could be. I do think in, in, the, in the Bay Area, there's this infectious sort of enthusiasm around entrepreneurship that's really fabulous. Um, that said, I think there's sort of a density of entrepreneurship that's happening in quite a few places now that, that's sufficient for the community to get traction. Um, maybe not the same sort of frenetic level, but frankly, in Boston, w what's nice about it is there's actually, I think, qu quite a good entrepreneurial community that's getting stronger and stronger and the reality is the big benefit of Boston is if you do start to get velocity, there's actually an incredible amount of talent available that you can actually hire. And the big challenge in Silicon Valley is if you're trying to compete with Apple and Google, Facebook for this talent, you're basically screwed. So, you know, if you actually get the traction and you start needing to grow in mass, it's very difficult, even if you actually as a company are having a good amount of success. So it's just like it's this ratio of the amount of talent to sort of uh, the amount of exciting opportunity. And I think Boston sits in an incredibly good spot. So we've certainly benefited from it because in, in Boston, you know, TripAdvisor is a very successful consumer internet company, right? And Wayfair is a very successful consumer internet company. Well, you know, there's not tons and tons of other examples. And as a result, and then if you look at Boston, Boston has tons of talent. So all of a sudden, our ability to scale, which is entirely dependent on getting amazing people, it's actually, it's easier for us to scale here than other places. And then frankly, if you're starting something new and you're even just hiring four people or six people, I think you're gonna be able to get higher quality people here easier given the amount of depth that's in Boston. So th there's, there's trade-offs to everything, but you know, I think eyes wide open, you know, places are different. You know, the reason we started Wayfair here is that we lived here. You know, we, Steve and I moved to Boston after we left Cornell, and that was 20 years ago and we basically, Love, it was the third company we started here. It's a great place to live, great place to raise a family, and we really enjoy it here. 
And the statements I just made about the, the talent that's here is absolutely true, but you know, we, did, we didn't start the company here because of that. We started the company here because we live here, and then we benefited from that fact. Yeah, and I mean, we have all these universities here that get pushing out talent every single year. BC graduates 2,200 students, you know, Harvard, MIT. I mean, there's a lot, there's, just, there's, a, there's, a, there's a lot of smart people that, that are coming out of these universities. I do agree with you, Phil. When I go to San Francisco, I go down to the Valley, there's a lot of energy there, and I don't think we're quite there yet with the energy, but we are changing the culture here. There, there are do, more, more risk-taking, and not, it's amazing walking around Boston uh, these days. You walk into the Innovation uh, District or uh, the Leather District or over the Seaport, Four Port Channel, Back Bay. I mean, there's a lot going on. You know, you go over there at lunchtime, you bump into entrepreneurs, tech stars, the WeWork offices. So we're getting there. I think it's, I think it's pretty exciting. You know, but I, I don't think we're quite yet there, that energy level. I mean, it'll take us another 100 years to change that culture. You know, so. <laughs> Do we have any questions from the audience? Anybody willing to take a risk out there? We're, we're here about getting out of your comfort zones. Um, if you, you got one, okay, we'll get, there you go, perfect. Uh, sorry, um, I apologize for the tie, by the way. Uh, can you teach big thinking? Is that, uh, does it come through instinct? Does it come, or is it something that you can really learn and uh, based on your experiences, uh, how does that develop? Can you, teach, can you teach big instincts? Can you teach entrepreneurship? Yeah, I mean, I, I think if the question is, uh, is it contrived, you know, it, it can't be contrived, but I think that uh, education is a critical role in inspiring and in learning uh, and connecting and seeing what's possible. You know, people, you know, we've backed a number of companies that were the, the idea, the kernel idea people started in university and like, you know, then they took it and commercialized it. Um, and, 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 uh, and that was one path. Um, but also the big idea thing, I, I guess I just want to, you know, make sure also to kind of reflect on it because some of our most impactful companies we've ever backed, you know, the idea itself, it wasn't obvious it was going to be as big as it, as it ended up being, you know, I mean, if, uh, if, if you told me, you know, if you asked me in 2008 if Twitter would have been a $20 billion company, um, you know, seven years later, I probably would have giggled a little bit. Like, you know, like I, I would say, I hope it's going to be, you know, great. But like, I, I, you know, and I, I think, um, you know, some of these things, you know, the, you kind of have a big vision, but, you know, how you get there is, is a bit of a journey. And so, um, I, I, but I, I think the direct answer to your question is I, I think, you, you know, this, we have a role. And, and I think uh, ins inspiring is, is part of it. What do you think, Phil? Teaching, not teaching, uh, instinct? Well, it's, it's both. You, you, what you can do is you can create an environment where people who would have an ability to be entrepreneurial can discover that. You can help them discover that. You can challenge them. You can put them together with people that they might not have met up with and, and give them projects to work on that. I think a lot of the great, you know, we always talk about entrepreneurship as if it's a single person. But if you look back at most of the great entrepreneurial startups, it was pairs of people. It, wasn't, it was rarely a single person. So putting people together with that, that kind of create a creative spark, and they feed off each other, and then brainstorm an idea, and then you encourage them to develop that idea, and you give them guidance. And then you, and I, and I think I'm a big believer in the critique process. Make them present ideas and, and shoot them down, and treat them, treat it like the real world, like nobody cares. And, and you gotta get beat up a few times to get, then you gotta work through that. You can create an environment to help those who have an ability to discover that. And I think with really intelligent uh, leadership and mentorship, you, yeah, you can help help those who would might otherwise have an innate talent for it. Okay. Now that we have somebody else up here from question. I come from Haifa, Israel, but uh, I really like the idea that uh, going out of the comfort zone is going from the east to the west, and uh, I really I I would ask if would you encourage students to go out of the comfort zone to other places uh, that are not speaking English and trying themselves and doing what's, what's needed, basically, for those things, rather than staying in America, the, the English-speaking place? Well, I know my answer, because I couldn't get a job in Boston, so I had to go to Spain when I got to BC. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, love to, I love to hear what you guys think. Getting out of your comfort zone, traveling abroad, uh, you know, going to a place where you, you don't know any, any infrastructure. Nerd? So, so, you know, earlier I gave an answer to a question which just said that you can learn from, you learn, uh, my belief is people really 
you know, and this is the wrong setting in which to say it, but I believe people learn a lot more from their own experiences, right, than they do from necessarily like a course per se. So if you think about like the benefit of courses, it's really that's pushing you to think about things and it's the people you interact with. So then if you think about traveling to other places, right, you're experiencing totally different environments and maybe people approach things in a different way. So I tend to believe that if you just, whatever your set of experiences are and you pursue experiences that you think you'll enjoy or that you want to pursue, but then if you try to absorb more through it, I really think that's how people learn. And then it helps shape you. And you, the earlier question about big ideas, like I don't think you can teach someone necessarily to have big ideas, but I think big ideas can occur to people when they're exposed to more and more different things and they think about things that are not necessarily the same thing they thought about yesterday. And so I'm sort of a big fan of it in, in that sense of just kind of pushing people to just learn broadly from a broader set of experiences. Opinions, differences? Yes. Go, go <laughs> as far away as you can. Absolutely. The further you go, the better, I think. Yeah. Get it. It's all about that risk taking. Why, why don't people take more risks? What, what, do, you, what do you see in, the, in those that don't take the risks, right? You know, we, we kind of, you know, what, what is it you see in, 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 you know, how do we encourage, how do we get people to get outside their comfort zone? Well, we can tell them take risks, but if inherently they're against risk, they're not going to do it. Well, I, I think, it, you know, Phil touched on it. One, one big thing, right? If you think about it, from the time you're young, you're generally taught to avoid risk, right? So it's sort of like, you know, the little kid wants to touch the oven, and you're like, no, 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 don't touch the oven, it's hot, you know, you get burned, you know, it's just, you get, you know, generally people start out very adventurous, and they're a little bit taught to be a little bit more reserved, because there's risk, and risk can, can get you in trouble, or whatever. So I do think there's something Phil touched on, which is that, you know, hey, there's no better time to start something entrepreneurial if you want to when, than when you're young, because you have the least risk. Right, because you know, generally the amount of money you need to live on when you're when you're pretty young is very low, you know, and you know you're, the experience you'll gain even if something doesn't work is is probably higher than the experience benefits you would gain if you went and worked, you know, in in some kind of uh, you know sort of straightforward function of a very big company where you really didn't get exposed as much. Whatever. So I think it's like one of those things where as much as you, you know when you're really young you're teaching folks to avoid risk. Somewhere in there, I think there needs to be teaching, and this is what I think like an entrepreneurship center could be great at doing, is encouraging people to realize that there's less risk than you think. So if there's something you want to do, that's probably the highest economic activity you could do as well. Through It's not like you're trading that off. You're actually, you're, you're gaining. So I, I think it's just, it's almost like um, undoing some conventional wisdoms around what, what really risk is. I, I, I don't know that you're actually taking a lot of risk when you try something, and it's just perceived. The percentage of students now traveling abroad at BC is off the charts, Very amazing. Hard. So I, I think it's already happening. I, mean, I don't know how, when I went here, traveling abroad meant going to Newton campus, right? <laughs> <laughs> now it's, I mean, they get around the world. It's, it's remarkable. But taking risk could be what you said earlier, Phil. Try take new courses, courses things you, you, you always wondered about. You know, don't just stick with what you, all, you, you know, try new things. Yeah, I, I look, I think there's a natural fear element here of, and, a, and a, a fear of failing, a fear of making mistakes, a fear of the unknown. And, and I think, you know, it's kind of, you know, we need to create an environment of, of so that mistakes are permissible, you know, and they're encouraged. And, you know, I, I was just giving this a similar talk, and I was in Paris three weeks ago, and, and they, they are wrestling with this thing where each generation is saying, hey, you know, you're kind of, there's a stigma of failing. And, and if you're an entrepreneur in, in France, even though they came up with the word, <laughs> um, like th there, is, there is this, you know, fear of failure and it is palpable. And I, and I think that's the thing that holds us back. Um, I, I guess, you know, I was paralyzed with fear. I, it was 1995, I got this job. It was the shortest job I ever had. But I took a job at Sun Microsystems in 1995 and I was there for 30 hours. And um, and, uh, and I got this offer to join this startup called Web TV Networks just as it was getting going, and it was like a 80% pay cut, um, unknown if it was going to get like the funding, and um, you know, and then, but Sun was this big company at the time and doing all this stuff, uh, but I walked in that office and I knew it wasn't for me, and then I was going, oh God, I'm going to resign from this place I was barely at, I was scared I might this other thing. You know, my parents are conservative. It was just this crazy thing. But, um, you know, my, you know, um, wife at the time, she just said, like, worst thing can happen is, like, it doesn't work out. And she had a good job as a nurse and would figure it out. And so that was the, she gave me permission to make a mistake. 
30 hours. So it was 30 uh, hours, yeah. one, and a, one day. He came in, enough time to come in the next day and tell yeah. me he didn't like the And then my work. first job at WebTV is I had to cut a deal with Sun for a Java license, and my name was still on the office. It was there the go. Perfect. <laughs> <laughs> So I think we got one t uh, last question. I think we're, we're supposed to wrap it up right around uh, six o'clock. So but, uh, let's make sure it's a student question. I think we the last two questions were typical. Um, no offense, old people questions. Yeah. <laughs> Can we teach them big ideas? Will they travel? I don't think that's the way kids think. It's like, yeah. give me a plane right. ticket, right? Uh, go, uh, do you want to just go back and get the mic? Uh, I think that's oh, yeah. for a student. Any the first student? Right, back great, there. good Run. job, Phil. <laughs> Maybe we'll do if you get two. We'll do two more questions if they're from yeah, students. Right. Okay. Yeah. Renee made me oh. promise. We have five past. We're all right, right, Renee? <laughs> okay. Um, this, thank you so much. This is always the uh, dangerous part for those who don't do a lot of BC student interactive things. That the secret of BC is that the students now have to have higher test scores to get in than we did when we went. By default now, that means they're smarter than any of us. Way smarter. Right? So when they ask questions, they usually stump us because they're smarter than we are. Oh. Okay. Thank you so much for taking the time to be here. My name is Shalin, I'm a senior at BC. Um, I guess my question for everyone uh, on the stage is, is there something you guys believe in that you feel that most pe other people don't believe in? So is there a contrarian view that you hold right now that only you feel that you believe? And what is that? And why do you believe that? <laughs> Stumps. All Stumps. Right. You nailed it. Yeah. <laughs> Oh boy. Noted. <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, I'm, 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 I think I'm the obvious answer stumped. is yes. The question is which <laughs> ones to share publicly. But <laughs> <laughs> hey, what's on the Apple roadmap for the next 36 months? <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah. Here, look, the next secret thing. I'm, I'm not going to say. Uh, yes, of course. I, I think uh, what, what what you're really touching on is an important point, which uh, which is uh, there's a real power and having a unique perspective on something that others don't. And so much so that others keep telling you, no, 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 you shouldn't be doing that, that's not what, what's gonna happen next. And you feel differently and you see an opportunity or someone says there's no, op there's no business there and you think there is. And that's where the passion comes from and that's where the leadership and the vision comes from. So I think you always have to have those things. You have to have those unique perspectives where you think something's going to change in the world and you wanna take advantage of that and create something that others just don't see or believe in as strongly. I think that's that's a core essence of an entrepreneur. Which ones? Well, I leave that to others to tell me. <laughs> Nerd? I've only thought of one so far in the time I've had, and I'm not gonna share that one. So I gotta, I gotta keep thinking. <laughs> Why don't we start running through Bijan's list? He's gonna have some good ones. Well, I mean, our, 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 we're in the leap of faith business. By the way, nice to see you again. <laughs> We met in Professor Gallagher's class uh, maybe three years ago, and uh, just to tell you how talented you know BC students are, uh, you know, uh, we talk what once a year, something like that. And every year he's like, "Hey, this is what I did this summer. I interned at Tumblr. I was at Square. I was at," and he's like, "What did you do after your sophomore year at BC?" And I was like, "I was a tennis counselor." <laughs> 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 like it's just night and day. So. Um, I, I think the thing that's changed about our business is that, you know, it used to be in the venture business this proprietary relationships, and it's no longer the case. Like, Oculus had a, had a um, Kickstarter campaign before we get involved. So the whole world saw Kick, uh, Oculus, uh, and then, you know, we got involved and people thought, like, we were crazy. And, um, and everyone saw Tumblr, but like a 19-year-old. So that, that's kind of what we try to do. And so we kind of always test ourselves that if we're getting involved in a in a startup that everyone thinks is gonna be great and there's 50 VCs that wanna make an offer, then it, we kinda hit the pause button. Um, so we're, we're trying to, this is, a, this is the never ending question for us. So I, I don't know if I have any blinding insight, but it's something that we're, we're obsessed upon. I will say, I'll confess, once a year I take a meeting with somebody building a, a jet pack, cause I'm, I'm like obsessed about these things. <laughs> but uh, I, I, we haven't backed one yet, uh, but we, we, di we did back a uh, electric bicycle company out of MIT, and uh, the whole, like the market leader in bicycles is like a $300 million market, so there's not a really big market there, but, but we have this feeling that, that this is gonna be something else, and so um, uh, nobody else yet agrees with us, but we're, we're gonna pedal away. <laughs> last, qu we have one last question. First, thank you for being here tonight. And uh, my name is Ben, I'm a freshman. And so based on Sean's question, so my question is like, what, what were the things that you tell yourself when you 
feel like there's no more motivation or like this is the down point and what were the things that you do where you tell yourself like kept yourself keep on going on how do you overcome that adversity and that that how did you persist and when you were facing tough times great great ending question how do you because we all go through it we'll give it to you first there's no time to think all right, so one thing, one thing I'd come in, and I think it sort of answers your question, which is, so after the first business that Steve and I started, we started a second one, and the second one, the first one was successful, the second one ended up not being successful, and so we, you know, so, you know, that was fine, and we figured that out, and so we wrapped it up, and so we were trying to figure out what to do next, and so we're sitting there, and we're going through idea after idea, and we're trying to, like, be, like, you know, really thoughtful, because, you know, we didn't want our third idea to not work, right, and so we're trying, you know, and so the key, if you analyze an idea really well, you can definitely figure out how any idea will definitely not work. <laughs> and so we got very good at this. So, you know, day after day, every day and we could just tear them apart. And we're, we're very, we're, we became highly effective at this. And so in the meantime, you know, we're not doing anything. Our energy level's sort of dropping. We you know, come up with new ideas or we, we'd see a business that was for sale and we'd look at it. But you can always find the problem in everything. And so one of the, so, so what, I, what I would tell you is I think sometimes when you're going through a tough time, like in a business, or your, you know, your tough time in, in between things or whatever, there's there's a lot I think to be said for momentum, which is at some point you just need to go do something, you know. And I, in my experience, you know, you, you have an idea, and the odds that it ends up looking exactly the same any meaningful period of time later is not, in in my experience, been super high. There's like twists and turns, and a lot of it comes out of just like again paying attention to what's going on, absorbing information, and 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 moving in different directions. So my general answer is to find some way to create momentum, even if you're not super certain that the direction is, is, is exactly right. So that would be, that'd be my, my suggestion. That's a great answer. Can I, can I make a suggestion? Can we just get a couple uh, women questions, just because uh, we had four dudes, and sure, I got a. There you go. I yeah. like All right, great. Good. <laughs> I saw Cindy up there. All right, great. Cindy, you got a question? Yeah, that's why I'm standing up here. Um. <laughs> yeah. Uh, <laughs> thank you guys so much for coming out. My name is Cindy. I'm a junior, um, actually majoring in entrepreneurship and finance. So thank you so much. Um, I'm on the board of the Shea Center, uh, on the Sarda Shea board. I'm really excited to have you guys here. Uh, my question is, you guys have taken a lot of risks in your lives. How do you kind of figure out what risks to take? Um, do you, is it more about the quality of the idea or is it, it an idea that you think can execute? I mean, you know. Do you think about whether the like the chance of success is that something you're ta you take into account? Uh, I think all of the above. It's 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 you need to look at it from the perspective of what do you care deepest about? What do you have a chance of pulling off and making happen? Do you, do you have other people involved, and what do they also want to do collectively? And and what will create something that has lasting value. It won't be just, well, we did something and then a year later you look back and who cared? Uh, what will really build an ongoing, growing thing that matters to the world and has, has unique value for, for yourself or your company? Uh, I think you have to look at it from all sides. Yeah, the only thing I would just add is you know, generally for me, like by the time we pursue an idea, like. I don't see any risk in it anymore. I'm like pretty confident it's going to go somewhere. Now th that doesn't mean they all work. They definitely don't all work. But y you know, you just the truth is like y you can get to where you really believe in it, even if there's a lot of unknowns, because you know there's enough there that you just sort of you really want to go for it. And so some of that's passion. Some of that's the the information you've been able to collect and, and the odds or whatever. But you basically the risk goes away because you become pretty bullish on it. All right. So this is. The very last question in the back. Thank you. Um, so I was just wondering, in terms of more venture or maybe acquisitions, when you look at a new um, startup or a company that's pitching to you, are you more likely to work with a founder that you think has um, the momentum to create something great, or are you looking more at the actual company and its idea? Or is it, I mean, I'm assuming it's a combination of both, but could you just speak to that? Yeah, I mean, most of what we do is early stage. Uh, so for us, it's it's uh, it's about you know the founders and the idea, and and we spend time getting to know the founders and and for us a lot of it is is why do they want to start this company you know it's 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 the why not necessarily the how, and um, so for us that gets us 
uh, to a place where you know we, we get really excited as well. Um, because in the early stage, it's not like you're investing in you know five years of revenue or you know uh, you know five years of product history. It's it's really you know taking a a, a making a, a, a decision on on um, on lesser known things. So for us, the founders critical are the founders, and then uh, and then you know wh why do they want to start this company, and and that that tends to get us uh, over the top. In Neeraj's case, he he had already built a successful company, so it was a bit of an exception for us. Uh, so we were. Very, very fortunate. Actually, my partner begged him for years to let us in, <laughs> and it took <laughs> took him a few years to to, to uh, allow make that happen. But um, but for the most part, that's what we obsess on. Fantastic. Well, we you know really reached the end of our time uh, allotment here. We what? How fortunate are we to hear from three of the of the most incredible entrepreneurs? <laughs> I want to end by once again thanking the Shea family. What a wonderful, momentous day we have today. And uh, can't, <laughs> the video was really touching, and I feel as if, uh, if Edmund Shea was here today, he would really be enjoying this conversation. We're very fortunate. So thank you all for coming. There, there's a couple uh, things I'd like to let you know. One is there's a reception afterwards. Uh, we encourage you to come and, and meet. There's a lot of students here. There's a lot of alumni. Let's connect. It's a great way to make connections and uh, start some mentoring opportunities. So please uh, do that. Tomorrow we have a, a, a day of panels. We have at 1 o'clock in Gasson an incredible panel on funding a business. Um, and then at, uh, we have the elevator pitch uh, final winners, for student teams presenting at about 2.15. And then at 2.30, we have another panel founding a business. Uh, so we got some, some great stuff going on tomorrow. On Saturday, we have the uh, BC NC State football game. And we have a big tailgate uh, before that for anybody who loves entrepreneurship in O'Neill Plaza. We invite all of you to come by. And so it's a real celebration. And we're excited. We thank you very much for, for coming. It's the beginning of a, of a great journey forward. Thank Andy Boyden again and uh, everybody here at BC for giving us this, this opportunity. And once again, really, I mean, this is fantastic, guys. It's just been a lot right, of fun. Thank, thank you. you very much. Real pleasure. Thank you.